Hey, everybody, and welcome to our next Leadership Lessons interview. I'm so happy to be joined today by my friend, Doug Hirsch, the co-founder and co-CEO of GoodRx. What's going on, Doug? Hey, Jason. Good to see you. You too. And for those of you that are joining us uh, for maybe our 35th session here, thank you for coming back and watching so many of our interviews. For those of you joining us for the first time, this is an incredible series that we do in combination with Entrepreneur Media, entrepreneur.com. Uh, where we interview CEOs of amazing household names and public companies where they talk about their leadership lessons, their if I knew then lessons. Um, and so we're really excited to have you here today, Doug, because I've learned a lot from you over the years. I'm excited to share you know, everything that I've seen you do and accomplish with so many folks here today. For those of you um, that may not know, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Comparably, where we are an employee review platform. And we are now very proudly part of Zoom Info, which is, you know, my opinion, the leader in go-to-market solutions to help sales teams and companies grow their revenue and sales operations. And so lots of things to break down here today, Doug, as far as public companies and growth and the state of the market today and startups and fundraising. I think everyone here is going to know and is most likely a, a user and a consumer and customer of GoodRx. I know that I am and my team avidly are, but in your own words, you know, how do you describe the GoodRx business today? GoodRx helps Americans find affordable and convenient health care. It really is a, a product that's driven by just trying to help Americans decipher our complex, confusing, and frustrating health care system. Too many Americans are, are, and everybody across the economic spectrum, are left in the lurch when you show up at a pharmacy or you go to a doctor and, you know, you're presented with pricing that just is insane. It makes no common sense. And so we're really here to help sort it out for consumers and find a solution that works for them and ultimately help them navigate our confusing healthcare system to just get an outcome so they can stay healthy, stay out of the hospital and, you know, um, really help their families as well. So we've been focused on that for uh, it's about 12 years now. We've saved Americans, I believe, $40 billion at this point. Um, but we're also focused not just on savings, but also, again, making sure that we can get consumers care when they need it. So yeah. that's what we do. And we've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. And the off chance that anyone listening here hasn't already used GoodRx, it is a absolutely magical experience. I would go download the app. And the next time you go to a pharmacy, just look up the prescription drug that you are trying to buy. And in many cases, you can get savings of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent. The thing that I was so impressed with, even higher, right? Even higher, yeah. I think there's this public stat that in almost 50 percent of cases, you actually beat out the discounts of insurance co-pays yeah. on uh, prescription drugs. That's just incredible. Yeah, there's this assumption, um, I, I think, especially in, you know, uh, call it uh, cities or or wealthier, uh, you know, areas where people assume that GoodRx is only for, you know, people who don't have insurance or low-income individuals. It's really not because our healthcare system takes no prisoners and it will, it will take anybody down with the extraordinary prices that consumers are forced to pay uh, when insurance isn't paying. And so, um, you know, I use it all the time for myself. And most often I find better savings with GoodRx than I can with insurance. We can walk through the bizarro, arcane world of pharmacy economics as to why that is. Um, but I wouldn't discount it, you know, folks who, who, you know, think, oh, I have enough money. I don't have to worry about that because you feel that way until that day you show up at the pharmacy and the drug is $500 or you end up in a medical clinic and your insurance says no and it's $2,000. I mean, everyone's got a story of how the healthcare system has just fallen short for them. And my job is to plug those holes. Yeah. There, there was a stat that I read that in the last year or two, you've saved over 5 million people. $500 a year or more. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, the numbers are pretty extraordinary and it's, it's both, look, it's a testament to the incredible people here who work really hard to fix this, but it's also a testament to how broken the system is. Right. I mean, everyone here knows the story of the $5,000 bandaid. I, I, my son was just in the hospital recently for an overnight, not nothing too serious visit. And I think the bill was $30,000 for one night, you know, and, and all the numbers are just out of proportion, you know? And so what excites me about this space, you know, as someone who's been on, working in the internet technology for a long time is, you know, as we try to make sense of data, what an opportunity in healthcare, right? It's the most broken. It's a $4 trillion space with just wild inefficiencies around pricing because it doesn't have those normal supply and demand forces. You know, when you're selling a pencil, you make it for a buck, you sell it for two. There's some common sense there as to what it should cost. But healthcare doesn't work that way because you've got other constituents all over the place, whether it be insurance companies, the government, 
um, you know, lack of competition. There's all these weird forces that, that end up with a $500 Band-Aid, right? And so uh, we're here to help try to make sense and to drive those you know, normal economic forces so that we have a healthcare system that makes sense and where people can know and then shop around for services knowing that they can actually afford it and won't get stuck with insane prices. Did you know when you were starting GoodRx how powerful it was going to be and how much it could scale? Did you have a sense of what the opportunity was? Or was that something as you, you know, got to the first year or two, you kind of figured out along the way? Well, that, that's, that's a fun topic because I feel like as, as an entrepreneur, you know, the best laid plans in entrepreneurship always go sideways, right? And so this idea, I, I don't believe anyone who tells histories where they're like, I knew from day one, I was going to go from here to there. You know, I feel like you never know who the constituency will be that resonates with your product. You never know, you know, what things you're trying to accomplish that will take off or not take off. And then there's timing and luck and all sorts of other factors that, that get in the mix. In our case, I just was fascinated and frustrated by the fact that I literally went to a pharmacy here in Santa Monica. They wanted $500 for a drug. I'm pretty cheap, asked my friends. And so I took the, the prescription back and went to two other pharmacies and found out that prices were all over the place. Not $10, like literally 50% less here and 30% less over here. Um, and everybody wanted to do the right thing, but nobody could because nobody had the data, right? And so when we first launched uh, GoodRx at, at Health 2.0 in San Francisco back in 2011, I think, um, you know, I, we just kind of threw it up there as like, a, who else cares? You know, is this interesting? And the constituency that really, really cared was actually doctors, which I did not anticipate at mm. all. I just threw this up there because I was a curious consumer. Um, but then doctors were just like, oh my God, I need this badly because when I write a prescription for my patient and then they yell at me because the, you know, I didn't warn them it was $500 or they just don't get it and they get sicker, I'm not doing my job. And so this incredible relationship early on that we built with healthcare professionals across the, you know, across the country and not just doctors, but the front office, discharge folks at hospitals, all these folks who literally, they, they, they got into this business because they wanted to help people and they weren't able to help people because people couldn't afford the treatments they were providing. And that's just been one of the most rewarding things of this, of this uh, experience for me. And it's also just one of those entrepreneurial lessons is, you know, keep your eyes out because the constituency that resonates with the thing you're trying to build might not be the one you think it is. And um, anyway, so that was, that was a joy from the beginning. Yeah. Without fully going down the rabbit hole, can you just give the cliff note version of how you're able to provide consumers such deep savings, as you said, and you're right, I've seen it many times. Sometimes it's 80, 90% off of what someone would otherwise have to pay right there at the pharmacy. What's the mechanics of how you're able to do that? So the way that healthcare works in our wonderful country is basically uh, whether it's a product or service, whether it's a drug or whether it's a surgery or a doctor visit, whatever, um, there's effectively a, a retail price, right? And that retail price is artificially high so that um, the, the provider, maybe a hospital or a drugstore or whatever, can then also give 80 or 90% off to an insurance company. So again, if I have, say, Anthem is my insurance company, Anthem walks up to, you know, pick your favorite Cedar sinai Hospital and says, hey, I represent a bazillion consumers in Los Angeles. You better give me 80, 90% off. And so Cedar sinai turns around and goes, okay, fine. I will, you know, give you 80, 90% off, but I'm going to make a Band-Aid $500, right? Uh, and that way I can still manage to, to run at a profit. And I don't want, I want to make sure that we don't call out the bad guys here, not because I'm a public company CEO, but because this is exactly what our system was designed to do. Every one of the constituents we're talking about has to make a profit and has shareholders. And so they're trying to figure out a way to either pay out less or charge more, right? And so basically what happens is you have this um, bizarro experience where you have you know, um, these huge discounts promised to insurance companies. And that just creates this distortion. There's also a whole government side I won't even really bore you with, but where there's, uh, you know, Medicare and Medicaid restrictions as well. The net result is that you have this list price that consumers were never supposed to see of, again, I'll just use the Band-Aid example, 500 bucks for a Band-Aid that everyone really knows should cost, say, two, three bucks, whatever. Um, in the old days, this didn't matter. When I first entered the workforce, I had a $10 copay for all my drugs. I had a minimal copay if I ended up at the emergency room. Life was good. But then because of the rising cost of care and because these are for-profit companies, insurance companies said, whoa, 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 I'm going to pay for less. I'm going to have a deductible, if you've ever heard these words. I'm going to have prior authorizations. I'm going to have step therapy. I'm going to have quantity limits. There's all these fancy words, which are all basically versions of, hey, you, patient, are going to pay more. Me, insurance company, are going to pay less. And so all of a sudden patients were seeing that outrageous price they were never meant to see. It was more an artifact of contracts. 
and that's where we have the real pain, I think, in the system. And today, you know, if you don't have insurance, of course, you were seeing that painful price too, or if, again, your insurance was just not covering that service. And so, you know, today we have a pretty messed up healthcare system where anyone who, for whatever reason, is not getting that coverage is being exposed to a price that's unrealistic for them to pay. Um, and of course, we have a tremendous amount of medical debt in this country. Um, and we're trying to tackle all this stuff, really, first and foremost, with just information. Just, just put it in front of you so that you uh, can be an empowered consumer. Because I know way too many people are just like, I'm not going to go to the doctor because it'll be a bazillion dollars. I'm, not even, I'm just going to avoid care altogether, which, of course, has all sorts of downstream effects, not only on your health, but on the economy and everything else. Yeah. We're going to get to it in a little bit. I know there's a much grander vision for GoodRx, where it's about a lot more than saving people you know, much needed savings at the pharmacies. I really want to get your opinion on on the healthcare system overall, and I think you explained it so well. It's just there, there's all these odd competing factors of partial government payments and Medicare and insurance companies. Like we've moved so far away from traditional just economics of supply and demand. From your point of view, what realistically can and should be done from this point forward? to fix as much as possible the healthcare system. So hundreds of millions of Americans aren't left without care that they need. And it resembles something that makes more common sense to everybody. I mean, I think step one is information, right? Like we can all complain about the healthcare system. We can all talk about how broken it is, but without having the information, you're, you're left in the lurch. People love to uh, you know, just talk about how terrible the system is, but they talk about it in a vacuum because they don't know. And so what we do at GoodRx, we actually have a huge research arm, which is focused on what are people actually paying out of pocket for prescriptions? Like put aside the list prices, because, you know, we've all read a thousand articles about the million dollar drug and all that, but what are actually people paying out of pocket? And when are people not able to afford it and thus not going on therapy and thus ending up with those conditions that they were trying to, you know, avoid with that prescription in the first place? And so we're really, really big fans of transparency because, you know, you can't fix the problem until you understand it. And so uh, we're a part of this thing called the Karen Alliance, which is a working, a working group in Washington trying to drive, you know, exposure to not just, you know, well, the cost of products, but also like, what does insurance look like? Like, you know, if Jason goes to the doctor, what's he going to pay in his copay or what's his deductible going to be? Because right now that's all locked up behind hidden contracts, which leads Jason to go, whoa, I'm just not even going to go because I don't know what it's going to cost. Imagine if we could tell you what things were going to cost first and guide you towards a better solution. Hey, maybe not go to that doctor, Jason, go to this one because he's in network. Maybe don't take that drug. Ask your doctor about this one because it does the exact same thing and it's on your formulary. Um, so I just want to start with information and then we can debate bigger policy questions like, you know, how all these for-profit constituents. And again, I want to reiterate, it's not that like a manufacturer is necessarily a bad person. I mean, manufacturers, for example, built COVID vaccines. That's incredible. Um, on the other hand, you know, like everyone is working on someone else's behalf, right? Like, you know, when you use your insurance, for example, remember that that insurance company is ultimately, if you're a self-insured company, probably like your, your new acquiring company is, you know, they're ultimately paying that bill and they want to control that. They want to make sure that they don't go bankrupt because all of their employees, you know, use too many healthcare resources. So everyone is kind of doing their job. The problem is just that because it's so broken, because there's no information, and because costs ultimately really keep going up for a variety of reasons, including litigation and all these other things, um, it's, it's really broken. So I just want to start with like, let's at least put all the information on the table, and then we can talk about a solution. One thing I'm curious to see if you know if there's any resources, you know, we all, like you talked about taking your son to the emergency room and for one night it's $30,000 and presumably, right? Like, we're fortunate enough to have health insurance that largely covers that. There, we all hear the stories of folks that either don't have insurance or didn't have the insurance coverage that they thought they had, where they had some catastrophic event, had to go in for some life-saving surgery for themselves or for their children, and then are saddled with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical debt. And I think every one of us that hears that, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And most often it affects folks that don't have the resources to handle that. Are there any opportunities in the market today when people get affected by those kinds of bills where they have avenues or recourses to deal with that after the fact? Um, there are some. I mean, it is crazy. Like I've literally seen in like corporate documentation and, and health plan documentation where they're like, if you can't afford it, go launch a GoFundMe. 
<laughs> is that really the state of healthcare in this country that we're like, go get a GoFundMe or go fly to Thailand and get it done there? That's an actual thing, this medical tourism thing where, because we actually know what it's going to cost when you go to Thailand versus here, where who knows what your coverage will be and all that other wonderful stuff. So, so I mean, in terms of resources, the good news is there are resources, right? I mean, first and foremost, you know, um, there's a number of entities that will help you negotiate. There's a number of nonprofit entities. There are a number of companies now have, um, services where you can send all your bills and they'll look at the coding on the bills and make sure that the, you know, and actually negotiate on your behalf to potentially, uh, you know, reduce that cost. Um, you know, I, I think there, there's good, I mean, there's mostly bad news, which is that you're going to get saddled with a massive bill if anything happens. Um, the good news is there are some resources, specifically in the world of prescriptions. There are very large prescription as, assistance programs that most of the manufacturers uh, make available. We actually have the biggest database, I think, on the planet of those programs. So when you look up a drug on GoodRx and you see that it's $5,000, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that there are a number of programs available, both from the manufacturer as well as governmental entities sometimes or, or nonprofits to bring down that cost. Um, it's still broken. I don't want to make it sound great. Um, the other thing I'll, I just have to say is whenever you're dealing with healthcare in this country, squeaky wheels get oiled. So, you know, if, if you're really upset about something, you got to push on your insurance company, you got to push on the provider of that service and say, hey, this is not working. And, you know, I, that's one option, which it's, it's sad that we've come to that point in this country, but you got to advocate for yourself. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. And hopefully it's going to help some folks out here. Uh, you did something that's really impressive to me that I don't see a lot of people do. Uh, you had this amazing career at Yahoo. Right? I think you were there, what, seven or eight years? 10 years. <laughs> oh, wow. 10 years, right? So it was, what, 1996 to 2006? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. And were absolutely vital in like all their early success. I think you were employee number 30. Is that right? You know, I don't know exact numbers, but it felt like 30. How's that? <laughs> and then I know you were early on with Mark Zuckerberg and were instrumental in helping to create like photo tagging at Facebook. To me, it's very rare that I've seen folks that have had so much success in the corporate world go then venture out into entrepreneurship. And, and you did it multiple times. Remember when you started a previous you know, healthcare company before this, how did you make the decision at that time to say, okay, I'm going to leave what could be a track here to maybe be CEOs of public companies. And I'm going to go start really from the very beginning. And I'm sure those early days were not easy. What was the name of your last company again? Is strong? A daily, daily strength. Daily, daily strength. strength. Yeah. yeah. And I remember when you started it. Yeah. Yeah. What I was think, that um, you know, I, I think we, one of the things about being an entrepreneur is uh, I, I feel like you're incredibly impatient. Um, um, you, I, I don't know what the correlation is between entrepreneurs and managers, meaning like, I feel like I'm a pretty good entrepreneur. I feel like I'm a terrible manager and we can talk more about that um, because I'm very impulsive, right? I see a problem. I want to go fix it. I don't think about sort of the layers of people that can do it. I want to fix it myself. Uh, I want to be on a whiteboard. I want to be sitting with a developer. I want to be sitting with a designer. I want to, I want to fix this problem. I want to get my hands dirty. And I feel like um, I've had tremendous success at small companies, like you said, whether it was Yahoo earlier or Facebook earlier, or obviously Daily Strength and GoodRx. I think where I've traditionally struggled is when I, I start dealing with more of the bureaucracy, I guess, of a, of a company, right? Where it's, you know, the hirings and the, um, you know, the procedures and the meetings and the organizational levels and communication and all that kind of stuff. It's not that I, I feel like there are things about that I enjoy doing, but it's a whole different skill set. Um, and so I just, I've always been in love with the magic of that aha moment, right? That like, oh my God, wait, what if we do this, right? And fortunately, GoodRx has been a bazillion of those where healthcare is so broken that there's no shortage of opportunities to, to do, make a little fix, which can have a real impact on people's lives. Um, but I guess, you know, after the, my Facebook experience, which had its wonderful and frustrating aspects, I just was ready. You know, I was, I was like, I was like, I want to have that aha moment and I want to have full control over getting it from point A to point B. Um, and I just, some of my favorite moments in my career have been those, you know, let's launch something. I'm nervous as hell. I put something up oftentimes it doesn't work or it's fake and just see if people resonate with it and listen, you know, I mean, I think that's one of the key skills of an entrepreneurship. I used to think everybody wanted to be an entrepreneur because it, to me, it's just like, it's like saying, you know, like, I don't know, I want to be a pilot. Like, it's just so fun. Um, and so part of my DNA, which is I'm curious about things. And I've learned more recently that not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Um, 
And it's actually an interesting test. You know, like I've, I've talked at a number of universities and people go take this class because they hear being an entrepreneur is cool. But then do you really want to be an entrepreneur? Meaning, meaning when you're drinking a soda and you're looking at it, you go, is there a better way for them to design these cans? Is there a better way to, to put them, you know, like everything I see, I'm always asking myself, is there a better way? Is there something new? And um, I don't know, I, that's what I'm going to do forever. And um, I guess that's ultimately why I started, you know, going down this path, which is just to be able to satiate this never ending curiosity. And uh, it's amazing. I've been able to do it here, to be honest, for what is it, 11 years now, because, you know, even though we're a bigger company, again, there's just so many different aha moments that, that we can uh, continue to attack. Yeah. Can you talk, you, you, you've successfully navigated a very unique situation too, of building the company as a co-CEO with Trevor. And we had on before, you know, from Morby Parker and they've done it successfully. What's that co-CEO experience been like? How do you divide up duties? How do you decide to make that as a choice? And I'm sure along the way, and I know you didn't raise a ton of outside capital, but especially as you were probably going public, I'm sure you got lots of questions about that structure. Why has it worked for you? And how do you think other people should think about it? I don't recommend it. And everybody who's heard about it thinks it's a disaster. And yet it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. <laughs> so um, the reason it works for us is, and there were actually three of us when we first got started, it was Trevor, Scott, and myself, um, was that we all have polar opposite interests. And, you know, I think when looking, first of all, it's so, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be able to go through a journey with someone else. I, I'm, you know, part of, another part of entrepreneurship, at least for me, is incredible insecurity, where I'm like, I think there's a better way, but is there really? And to be able to have someone by my side who's like, you know, who's helping sort that out is incredibly helpful. I, I mean, again, I spend most of my life identifying something, thinking there's a better way, and then running around to the 35 people around me going, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? And so to have someone, a co-pilot with you as you go through this process to assess it, especially someone with a totally different view of the world. You know, Trevor and I are so close and wonderful friends, but we really don't like what the other person does. <laughs> so, you know, our days consist of me going, hey, what if we do this? And he's like, yeah, I really don't care, but check out this other way I figured out we can run our business better or this business relationship or this company I want to acquire. And I'm like, that's awesome. I really don't care. And so we have this magic where we don't step on each other's toes. We're also very clear uh, with the people that work for us. Because the worst thing that would happen, one of my greatest fears is that, you know, uh, someone comes in and says, should I do A or B? And Trevor says A and I say B. And the person's like, I don't understand what's going on. So we actually have a very clear reporting structure, which is in honesty, everybody reports to Trevor. I'm still very engaged in the areas that are important to me. Um, but I always want people to be clear that there should never be a do this or do that conversation. If they feel that is, they let us know and we'll sort it out immediately. But I want to have very clear reporting lines for people so they don't go nuts. And at the same point, I just feel like we're two halves of a person, right? And um, so it works for us. That said, be very careful when choosing, you know, co-founders and co-CEOs because it gets really sticky really fast. Yeah. I always ask this question during interviews. What's your work superpower? What do you do better than anything else professionally? Wow. I don't, I don't think I have any superpowers. So I want to be careful to overextend my, uh, my skill set. But I mean, I guess, you know, as I talked about earlier, I just love the early stages of iteration. I love the early stages of just a group of smart people getting together and figuring stuff out. And I, even in a company as large as ours, I, I want that all the time. And so I'm, I'm constantly engaging with folks. I don't care what level you're at. I just like, like I, yesterday I was walking around, like literally jumping into people who are like designing stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? Can we do it together? Like, let's talk about what you're designing. Let's, and cause I feel like one of the challenges you get bigger is communication. And so I spend a lot of time and I love doing it, just talking to people and making sure we're all on the same page and asking about why they do what they do, asking why they came here, asking what health event in their lives, because everyone's got one, led them to be here in the first place. And then talking about how we can turn that into a product to actually help more people. Mm. And so I'm not saying it's a superpower, but I, I do really enjoy, um, I, I, I wanna work in a, in, a t in a family of people who just really are motivated to fix this terrible problem that we have in the country. And so uh, whether it's talking to a bunch of people, doing it all hands, or just you know one-on-one -on -one engagement with people. It's just something I, I relish and love to do. Um, and I hope I can keep doing. Yeah. What did you, looking back on the you know, 10 plus year journey so far, what was the hardest point? What, what was the, was it that first year? Was, was there some point along the way that it was just the most challenging to get to the next stage? I mean, every, I mean, you know this too, I'm sure is, uh, uh, 
it's a never ending series of waves crashing down in your head, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, first and foremost, I, I don't think there's a day I, I don't wake up assuming that some competitor outside factor is going to crush me, right? It's just, there's always, every day you wake up dreading that headline that says, you know, massive company out to destroy comparably launches today, <laughs> you know, like, um, so there's that natural, what do you want to call it? Competitiveness slash fear that I think drives a lot of urgency, even, even 10, 11 years later. Um, I think the process of being a public company has been really, really stressful. I think the two rounds of private equity did also were very stressful because it's sort of like the company's in play and this thing that you birthed is suddenly, you know, suddenly maybe going to be in the hands of someone else. And how's that going to play out? I think being a public company has been really, really challenging, uh, not just because of our stock price, but because of all of the additional uh, burden and distraction, I think, that it puts on us. Um, but, you know, I don't think, I mean, every day is really challenging, but every day is also really rewarding. So I think that's just, that's what happens when, you, when you're a founder of a company, you know? I think you'd know that. So last year in 2021, we had, I think, the largest number of tech IPOs or certainly close to it in, in 20 years. It, if you could go back, you know, two years and give your own self advice, like what advice would you give to yourself and anyone else that's now thinking about trying to take their company public? What would you wish that you knew? Well, the advice that I give myself all the time and never follow is to not be distracted by the publicness of the company, if that makes any sense. Like, you know, the day we went public, the company didn't change. It's still, we're still on the mission to do the things we want to do. We're still very driven by, um, you know, we, we like to say we do well by doing good. Um, and that is exactly what I want to continue doing. It's very hard when you have legions of public investors who are saying, hey, what about the stock price? And hey, what about this? And why your margins look like this and your guidance looks like that? It just becomes a distraction and it becomes something that, um, you know, I want to make sure the energy of the company is going into the forward progress of the company. Um, and so that's been really challenging. Um, and, you know, again, fortunately, there's two of us. So Trevor takes the majority of that. Um, but I, you know, my goal is to not look at the stock price all the time and to um, really continue to focus on doing what's right, because I think ultimately stock markets reward long term performance. And, and again, because we do well when we do good, we will hit that and we will do those things. Um, but it can be very hard, you know, on a day to day basis, if you know, whatever stock markets down X percent, your stocks up or down X percent to um, disregard that and continue to keep your focus. You know, and it, it permeates through the employees and stuff because, look, I, I, one of the key reasons we went public is I wanted to reward the incredible people that work here and let them buy the house and have the kid and support their parents and all the things they wanted to do. Um, and that just puts even more pressure that, you know, beyond the normal founder CEO pressure that you have every day. Yeah. So for those 10 years that you spend at Yahoo and, and, and a shorter stint in Facebook, what were the big lessons that you learned there that you applied as you, as you grew GoodRx? Like, because you talk about too being, you know, impatient and, and wanting to just get stuff done. That, that's not always a trait that jives perfectly at, you know, large companies with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of employees. And so how did you leverage that time to help you make yourself more successful at GoodRx? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's really about keeping focus on maintaining that velocity, you know, of, of new product development. Um, I, I guess I ultimately just want to work at product driven organizations that are, that are continuing to improve, that are continuing to roll out new reasons for people. I, I always think about, you know, a person's awake time during the day as being incredibly precious. And how are you going to get two or three minutes of that person's time or an hour? And it's incredibly flattering when someone has chosen to again, and put your app on their phone deck or to actually, God forbid, open it up and use it or take one of your cards and put it in their wallet. Like that is like, what, a, what an incredible concept that you build something that um, people chose to spend time with. I mean, time is the ultimate commodity everybody has. And so I guess I'm always really focused on what can we build that can contribute to someone so much that they are willing to give us time and ultimately more time, whether if we solve prescriptions, can we solve medical care? If we you know, solve medical care, can we help people with diagnosis or care management? Um, and so those are, you know, that's, that's the sort of holy grail, I guess, for me in terms of being able to um, 
you know, find additional pain points that we can help for a consumer. Now that can go wrong. I mean, I think, you know, in somewhere like a Facebook's case or TikTok or whatever with the algorithm, and, but I'm not, you know, I'm not in the social media game anymore. I'm not trying to get eyeballs to put ads. I'm trying to get eyeballs because I, that means you have a health issue that I can help you solve. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess I just, um, as long as I'm developing amazing new products and services to help people, I'm happy as long as I don't forget to do that when I, whether it's a public company thing or employee related stuff or whatever. Um, that's, I think when I get, you know, less happy. Right. And, and, and I'm, I'm not able to do, cause to me, it's the same magic. It's the same. It's funny. I recently went through this pile of papers I had from when I was in high school and I was writing down business ideas when I was 18 <laughs> that I had no idea how I'd ever build. I was a political science major and, and it's just, it, I, apparently that's what I'm built on the, on this earth to do. So as long as I'm conceiving and building the cool new stuff, um, I, I'm in my happy place. So yeah, that's, that's what I want to continue to do. Yeah. That's an interesting parallel. I was, I was poli side too. And I think I've got a notebook. <laughs> I'm sure whatever I wrote in there was much more idiotic than your ideas. Um, well, but that's, but Jason, that's kind of what's um, like, I'm on this, I'm doing this job at this point because I really do want to fix the state of healthcare in this country. It's like, yes, we're, we're a for-profit company. Yes, I want to put good numbers on the board, but that comes hand in hand with like realizing that we have a problem in this country. Mm -hmm. The stat I love to talk about is, you know, 1% of our GDP in this country goes to dialysis, right? Which is end-stage, you know, renal failure, which comes from, you know, a variety of reasons, but one of them is if we didn't take care of people that were pre-diabetic and then when they were diabetic, they end up with dialysis, right? And it's like, I mean, Imagine the impact, like, let's just take that. Let's pretend for sake of argument that you could come up with a way to keep people out of dialysis, right? And you could make even a quarter, you know, a one, a 25% of the people that end up on dialysis didn't have to end up on dialysis. That's like, that's like real money. That's like probably, like, you know, half the budget, I'm making this up, but probably half the budget of like we put toward education or arts, you know, like, like these are real big numbers that, um, you know, that I think can make a real impact on really our, our, our entire nation. I mean, it's, it's swinging much bigger than just, you know, the next quarter's, uh, you know, revenue. So, yeah. 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 Well, I think we're all lucky to have someone like you, you know, and Trevor and your team that, that are working on those problems every day. Let, let's go backwards for a moment. If you could take a time machine back into, the, into your 20s and give that Doug any professional or personal piece of advice, what would it be? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe. Uh... You know, I think there is a challenge that comes at like most of the entrepreneurs I know are not necessarily happy. I think uh, there's a tremendous amount of insecurity that drives entrepreneurship where you really want to, um, I don't know, I don't know why, but at least for me, I feel like the insecurity drives me, but it's also not say healthy. I think there seems to be a high correlation between a variety of mental health, where it's ADHD or um, depression or I don't know what, or just challenges with relationships. And I think, I mean, look, Gurex was born out of, uh, I was trying to fill a mental health drug at the time in, in 2011. And so um, I wish there was a way to uh, be able to do all the wonderful things I've had the opportunity to do, uh, maybe, but without the baggage that comes with it, right? Um, I think it's really, really stressful. I think you know, I think of the last, gosh, 25 years, and it was intense, you know, and that's a wonderful thing and a scary thing at the same time. So I guess, you know, a little bit of the, the standard, like, don't sweat the small stuff, right? Like, you know, I, I can remember one time with at Daily Strength where, like, I, I punched a wall, and I, and I was like, I'm not a punch the wall kind of guy. Like, like who is that guy? <laughs> um, and so just, you know, trying to keep things in perspective as exciting and wonderful and energizing as it is to do product development and to grow companies. Um, it is, you know, it's not as important as the other things. You can make sure you can be with your family and make sure you can, you know, have quality friendships and, and stuff like that, because it can be all consuming. There's always another problem to be solved. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think you have to be a little careful. I mean, I'm older now, so I can look back and say, um, I, I love the things I built, but it came at a cost, right? Yeah. Well, I very much agree with that. And it's something, you know, I taught this entrepreneurship class at UCLA uh, this last quarter. And I think we've glorified entrepreneurship and having started two companies now and, you know, been fortunate to have sold them both. You know, I try to tell people, 
I've always felt the most purposeful in my life. I've always felt the most driven and that I'm doing what I meant to do when I'm building companies that I start you know, with other folks. But those were not the peak periods of my happiness. And in many times they were on the lower end because you're dealing with all sorts of pressures and responsibilities and like you. You know, I think all of us feel like we're faking it until there's some kind of external event that gives us some, you know, something on the scoreboard that we can point to say, okay, well, I guess we're doing okay here. But also, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of delayed gratification for other areas of parts of your life that you're looking for. And I just think as long as folks know what they're signing up for, they're probably more likely to be successful and they're more likely to manage that time you know, as health, as healthfully as possible. I also think it's, it's interesting. And I don't know if you experienced this too, but like, I feel like we live in a, in a society or a tech world where um, we celebrate fundraising as if it's like the biggest thing in the world, but nobody seems to understand that fundraising just means you've just paved a runway that's that much longer. Right. And that may be great if you, you know, if you love what you do and, um, but it's very strange how we celebrate fundraising so much. And the flip side is when people do sell their companies and you've been there more recent than I have, it tends to be anticlimactic in a way. Like you think it's going to be this, I always imagine myself at the finish line of a marathon and everyone's cheering at the end. And then you go through it and you're kind of like, that, that, like it's more ambivalent. I feel like my, my emotions are more mixed. Um, and so it's strange that we act like fundraising is this massive event. And yet when you actually sell your company, it's always sort of a little bit more... Um, I don't know what the word is. I've, I've always felt a little bit unsure about how to feel about that and it, that it's less of an event than I thought it was, but I don't know, just my observation. Every entrepreneur that I know has uniformly told me that the predominant emotion that they have, and this is how I felt, you know, after an acquisition is relief, not joy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it's just because there's, there's so many things that we're all responsible for, we're responsible for, you know, our team, for our investors for, you know, the constituents and customers and making sure it's doing a good job, you know, for everybody that's affected around that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I very much agree with you there. Another, you know, another uh, thing to watch out for is the what ifs, right? <laughs> is the, well, what if I didn't do that? And, and what if we'd done this, right? Because then you'll just drive yourself nuts, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. So let's talk about fundraising for a little bit. Here we are, you know, in June of 2022, and the predominant news in the tech space over the last two, three months has been how, you know, public market um, valuations have, you know, contracted. The fundraising environment is so different. I think one of the things that I definitely relate to you is I remember you all hardly raised any money at all for GoodRx. You bootstrapped it. And then, you know, much later, after you had lots of success, I remember you raised the private equity round. You know, for our first company, DocStop, we raised $4 million total for comparably, you know, we only raised $16 million, which, you know, by today's standard is pocket change. And I'm curious to get your take on fundraising in two regards, both A, what you just said, that maybe as operators, we are focused too much on how much money we're raising and not the business that we're building. And then secondly, what do folks need to do to be successful in fundraising, and especially in a market like this, where it's going to be harder than it's been over the last, you know, 13, 14 years since 2008? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the fascinating things I've been thinking about recently is anyone who's younger than, say, I think 34 has never been in a down market, right? Things have just gotten easier in the sense that there's been more money available and the stock market's gone up and to the right and there's been more funds you know, and it's a, it's a short memory that we have of the fact that funds dry up and, you know, it can be really, really challenging to, to raise money. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that um, it's, you know, I, I'm a big fan of trying to go as far as you can by yourself before you raise money. I think, I mean, even today though, with the down market, there is so much money sloshing around out there. Like, didn't I just see that there's what is it like 692 SPACs that are looking for a company to take public and that's all going to end poorly, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so I, I always feel like, you know, as much as there's all this money floating around out there, we also have an incredible decrease, which has been ongoing for say 20 years now in the cost of getting something started, right? And the cost of trying something out. And so, you know, in the old days, you'd literally draw like on a napkin and be like, hey, uh, you know, you want to give me 20 million bucks for this? Now, I think you can take a company pretty far 
you know, you can, you know, use all the existing tools out there, the, the Shopify's and other APIs and all this stuff. And you can stand something up by yourself without having to raise a ton of money. And, you know, if it's the kind of products I like to build, it's, you know, four or five smart people in a room, give it a few months, stick it up there, do some very targeted advertising. Um, you can even do like dummy websites and things like this and throw an app up there. And all this stuff is so easy to do without spending an extraordinary amount of money. And maybe you can actually get, you know, far enough down the path to, to air test this thing and see how it works um, without it, both the pain of having to raise money and also being able to raise, of course, at a higher valuation with some validation of your, your theories. So I'm just, I've just always been a big fan of, of trying to control your own destiny for as long as you can. Um, and acknowledging that when you bring a third party into the mix, you know, you, you, you know, again, whatever you want to do is great. If you want to run this company forever, that's fantastic. If you wanted to sell your company for a hundred million, but then you go out and you raise, you know, 20 on 200, you ain't selling it for less than a billion without having major friction with your, you know, investor, I'm sure you know, all this stuff, Jason. So it's like, um, I just like to control my own destiny as long as I can. And I actually think now is a great time with this disruption where people are moving around to jobs, people open to new things. You know, the world in general it has a, all sorts of stress points which open up new opportunities for consumers. Um, I would say it's actually a great time to be building new stuff. And I'd be thinking about how you can bootstrap it yourself for as long as you can and worry less about whether, you know, Fund A or Fund B is writing 20 or $50 million checks. Worry more about, do I have a sustainable business that, um, you know, that I really deeply believe in and, and how far can I take it before I have even have that conversation? Because I don't know, I just think that, you know, a lot of times we use the fundraising as a prop for a business that really necessarily shouldn't exist anyway. I mean, God knows every cycle in tech, you know, I always think of it when I see the planes flying over the beach here in Santa Monica advertising, whatever the latest, you know, dot com trend is. And it's like, <laughs> really? Like, how about you actually create a sustainable business that doesn't need the planes? Um, cause that always feels like the first ones to drop when, you know, sorry if comparably with flying planes, um, <laughs> you know, I just, I, 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 we, we grew good X from the beginning as, as a, like, like it was a mom and pop shop, right. Where if we couldn't make ends meet, we we're going to have to shut it down. We did never got over our skis. We raised responsibly, uh, and we tried to do as much as we could, you know, and I think we maybe spent a hundred grand between like the three of us over the course of like six months to a year to get it up, to show what it could do. Uh, before we even started talking to anybody about any money. Yeah. As you are now on the in investor side and as you invest in more and more, you know, angel deals and private companies, what are the key char characteristics that you're looking for? Yeah, I, I don't do a ton of investing only because so I'm a public company CEO, so I have to avoid all that stuff. Um, and, uh, but I, I mean, I have invested in a few things and I think I, Ultimately, it comes down to the person. I feel like it always comes down to the person. It comes down to someone who's just like, they are not going to stop until they solve this thing. And the thing they're solving is really important. You know, I, I, again, I'm a DTC guy. I'm not really excited about someone who can exploit a wrinkle in a B2B, blah, 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 process, SaaS. Like, it's great. There are plenty of people to do that. That's not me. I, I'm insecure enough that I want to be able to go home and tell my wife and kids about it and not have them fall asleep. So, so <laughs> which pharmacy economics, trust me, is on the border. <laughs> so, um, so I, I get really excited about someone who's doing something real tangible that feels like an opportunity that the world hasn't exploited. I don't worry about the spreadsheets. I don't, especially in like the early rounds, the seed stage stuff, series A, nobody cares, really. Everyone has a chart that shows up into the right that you're gonna make a billion dollars in 2028 or something. I disregard that completely. I feel like, is this something that's seismic and different that is approaching a problem in a different way? Um, and that, that's the, those are the bets that I usually make, but it really also comes down to the person and the insight that they have and the way that they can draw the line from the problem to the solution. And I don't really care about pedigree. I, I think seasoned entrepreneurs can make mistakes. Unseasoned entrepreneurs can be brilliant. It, it's, um, you have to sort of be an equal opportunity uh, explorer. Yeah. What do you know and practice about management today that you didn't 10 years ago? Well, I've always kind of managed the same way, and I don't know if it's been successful or not, which is we talk about my insecurity a lot. My insecurity is I want people to like me. This is probably the opposite of Management 101. <laughs> where, um, I want to be surrounded by people who are here because they want to be here. I want to be surrounded by people who are here because they care about what we're doing. Um, you can go, I mean, even in this economy, apparently you can get a job anywhere. You can get you know, a decent salary anywhere. Um, I want people who are here because they really want to be here. I want people who feel the same passion I do, who think about this issue, you know, 24 seven. 
um, and are motivated to do it and are ultimately kind people. Like the biggest success that we had at GoodRx, there are like 12 people in the world that understand pharmacy economics. We didn't hire people that were those people. We hired people who were just really smart, awesome people who were really good at whatever the skill set we were looking for, whether it be developing or like, I, I always love to point at our, our, our chief, uh, our general counsel, who's just this wonderful woman who knew nothing about pharmacy, but she's just incredibly smart. And now she's like in charge of everything. And it's just wonderful. Um, so I, I really think if you find someone who's smart and competent and excited and wants to dig in, um, they can ultimately be trained to do anything uh, and then rise to the ranks and be really successful. So we don't necessarily value experience as much as just enthusiasm and intelligence. Is there an area that over the last, you know, five, 10, 15 years that you have most improved as a leader and a CEO? Is there something that you can point to that, I, I don't imagine you have a lot of blind spots, but is there something you can point to say, that was something I was not good at and I focused a lot of energy and attention to get better and you've seen the results of it? Well, maybe I'll tell you something I'm working on as opposed to something I've solved. Um, someone told me like a year ago that when you are leading a company, especially of this size, you have to project confidence and positivity for people. And that's hard for me because as we already discussed, I tend to be sort of negative. I tend to, like when someone presents something to me, I, I try to shoot holes in it because if it can stick, get through the holes, then it, it, to me, it's a good idea. Um, but that can be demotivating for people. And so I, I'm trying harder. I'm not saying I'm succeeding to have a positive outlook on things. When someone presents something to me, not be like, well, what about A, B, C, and D? To be like, hey, I really appreciate the effort you put in here. Let's proactively, constructively look at ways to improve this. Um, because my natural tendency is to just like blurt out, like, what about this? And what about that? And that the context when you're in a thousand person company can be like, oh, he's so mean or he didn't care. Or, he didn't like my effort. Um, and so I'm trying harder to, I like to think I'm just in a group of people who are all similar. I don't, I'm not big on titles and I'm not big on treat person A, different person B, but it's hard to avoid at a thousand person company. And I'm trying to play the role a little bit more of a, of a leader and a captain only because I personally don't like those things, but I think there's an expectation of those. And so it's, it's a bit of a struggle for me because I, I, my, my weight, my words should not be worth more than the next person. I feel that strongly, but for whatever reason, they're expecting that of me. So I have to somehow walk that tight rope of, of, of um, being, of listening and being a part of the same family, but at the same point, guiding things a little bit. And I'm not going to say I've solved it, but it, it's something I'm working on a lot. Outside of Trevor and Scott, who, who in the company, which one of your employees have you learned the most from and what did you learn from them? I mean, ironically, I feel like I learned from everybody in different capacities, right? I mean, first and foremost, everyone here has a, has a healthcare story. And so in fact, when new employees come in, I always say, before we talk about pharmacy bizarroness and healthcare bizarre, tell me the story. Tell me the story of what happened, especially if they're in product. And I'm like, and, and, and then reflect on why current products aren't solving that problem. Right. And, and like, and describe your dream product before I tell you about all the terribleness in healthcare that's going to stop that product from ever coming to existence. Because that's that magic, right? At that point, they're just a consumer. They're a smart, educated, you know, a talented consumer. Because that's what we're trying to build for ultimately, right? Which is what, what consumer hole can we fix? So I learned from a, a ton of folks. I really love our patient advocacy organization. That's our word for customer care because we will answer the phone when anyone calls and try and help navigate them to affordable care. Um, you know, I, I, I have learned a ton. Actually, more recently, we focused a lot on manufacturers and drug manufacturers who um, actually, you know, despite my, my perception was always, oh, they're evil and they do bad things. The reality is, is actually there's a lot of really thoughtful folks there. And I've really enjoyed getting to know folks both on our team and then at manufacturers who actually went to those companies because they wanted to actually do things like cure cancer or, or, or solve COVID. Um, and they've been surprisingly open to doing really interesting things together. So I don't know. I mean, I, I learn every day here because there's just so many different complicated things um, to navigate. And, uh, you know, I, I think across the board, especially these days, we're bringing some incredible talent as, you know, this great resignation thing happens. I, I just two folks here, you know, former uh, employees, and they're just incredibly talented folks who, who want to dig into healthcare. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm learning from everybody. All right. Two more questions before we wrap up here today. What's your crystal ball tell you about the future of work, whether it's, you know, remote, hybrid, different ways folks are working together. You know, we're living through, I think for me, 
a once every hundred years change in how work is done, especially, you know, at, at like in, 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 for in office work, what do you see how that's going to evolve over the next couple of years here? Hmm. I mean, I've been really impressed with how remote work has not been an issue. You know, if you go back, I don't know, five years, Zooms were really difficult. You couldn't get a word in edgewise. We built this new headquarters, not intentionally, by the way, but we happen to build really great soundproof conference rooms. And it's like become totally organic. Like there's nothing that's lost when someone is Zooming versus being in person. So I'm kind of intrigued by, I mean, imagine the opportunity that opens up when you can hire someone in Des Moines or in Tallahassee or something, and they can have a full functioning experience. Now it's not perfect, obviously. And I am a big fan of spontaneity and whiteboards and all that kind of stuff. But I do think that we've reached a point where the, the pool of talent we can fish in is so much greater. And we are doing that. We're hiring people all over the place. And I'm sure we're not unique to that. Of course, everybody's doing that. Um, so that's just kind of exciting because I don't have to, you know, have an office in San Francisco, an office in LA and an office in New York and call it a day. Um, uh, so I think that that is particularly exciting. Um, I think, you know, what I'm also really excited about on our side, it's not necessarily future work, but, um, you know, I'm really interested in wearables and, and healthcare and, and sort of the convergence of, of um, you know, live stats of like, I'm sitting here talking to you, but there can be, there's a monitor at the other end that's actually reading what I'm, you know, my, my vital stats and then potentially handing it off. So I'm really, really uh, intrigued by this idea of proactive healthcare, meaning like mm -hmm. Jason doesn't wake up in the morning and go, gosh, I guess I should go to the doctor that, um, you know, the doctor's coming to him or the doctor's constantly monitoring him, of course, with AI and things like that. And so I'm really intrigued by, um, devices that we'll all be wearing at some point um, that will just help us stay healthy. And so that's just a big category. It's not work per se, it's more within the world of digital health, but um, there's just so many opportunities for all of us to have a more uh, continuous relationship with the healthcare system. And I think that'll impact all of us it, going back, you know, both employees as well as just consumers in general. So I don't know, that's an area I'm, I'm really hot on. Yeah. All right, one more future looking question. Five to 10 years from today, what does GoodRx look like and how is it different than the business that, you know, you and Trevor have built up till today? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear for us, which is, you know, today we play in the $400 billion prescription drug annual opportunity in this country. Um, that means that that's 10% of the $4 trillion that's spent every, every year. And like I said in the beginning, I mean, I, I just want to keep people healthy. I want to keep a lot of hospitals. So drugs are one part of that, um, but everything else in healthcare remains wide open. And it, I mean, as much as I feel like we've made progress, the reality is, is like no one's price shopping around for, you know, anything involving a hospital right now. People are trying it. It's just a terrible experience. No one's price shopping for imaging. No one's price shopping for mental health visits. No one, there's just, these things don't really exist yet. And, uh, and not just price, I should be clear. It's also affordability, it's access. It could be home visits, it can be Zoom. Um, so I really think that despite our incredibly terrible healthcare policy in this country, um, you know, innovation is going to lead a new round of potentially cash pay experiences where we can find affordable things where a consumer can just pay on their own an affordable price to get that preventative care. Cause I, I'm just, I'm laser focused on keeping people healthy because once they become unhealthy, the costs just spiral up dramatically. You have to have insurance. The government gets involved. There's medical debt. We go on and on with all the terrible things and not everything is avoidable, but a lot is. And so what I'd like to be in 10 years, I'd like to sit here, you know, sit here with you and say, you know, uh, a million people have led happier lives and stayed out of the hospital uh, and avoided traumatic medical events because of good Rx. That's where I want to be. Uh, well, I think there's a lot of us cheering you on to make that happen. You know, it's, I, I feel fortunate that I've gotten to know you over the years and every interaction I had with you, I feel like I learned something or came out smarter for it. And I've certainly watched, you know, from the sidelines here with deep admiration. Thank you for being so incredibly, you know, open and transparent today. I can tell you, there, there are a set of entrepreneurs I'm genuinely jealous of. I think we all feel proud of our accomplishments and what we do, but you know, you and your team are doing something really meaningful and special to very intimately affect and help millions of people. And it's when you see stories like that, that everyone wants to rally around for your success. So we're rooting you on here. And I want to see that same outcome for you as well, too. Thank you so much for your time here today, Doug. Thank you, Jason.
Talk to you soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We're looking forward to having you join us for an amazing set of uh, speakers coming up, including the CEO of Redfin and Ancestry.com. Thank you all for continuing to join us. And we're going to continue to bring amazing guests like Doug. We're going to share their wisdom and thoughtfulness here with all of you. Stay healthy, stay safe. See y'all, everybody.